Thanks, Al, for the introduction. Great. And also, I have to say, yesterday when I joined here, the scenery, I really felt home. Um, because of the hospitality, it was great yesterday in the Makaki something bar. And, um, and also, I felt like back in Germany, because apparently, yesterday I heard things like, oh, can we do it? There is a problem, not a solution. Um, so I really felt back like being at home. And that's why I also changed the title, why I will use AirTaxi soon. And what brings me on stage, so what gives me credit to speak today here, it's first of all that I really am passionate about mobility, about intelligent mobility. So I worked before that for Mercedes, 10 years plus, creating new business models with Car2Go, my taxi and others. This is one driver. The second driver is that I travel a lot, like you probably also, I, without, without a doubt. So private and business traveling, I love it when it works. Um, so seamless traveling, that payment on demand works, all that has to function, but does not always function. And thirdly, what brought me to Volocopter also is, of course, uh, sci-fi. It's a high-tech product. Um, with um, new emerging technologies that revolutionize and give benefit to the customer. And I always have to ask the question because not that it's getting boring, who already knows Volocopter? Okay, so I can skip some of the slides, that's good. Um, and who of you already flew a helicopter? Okay, then I don't understand the question yesterday, why should the service come? Because flying over a city, and that's the other paradigm to economics and is there a, a demand, is flying uh, over the city. And we did that, and I mean, it's good that this comes with my job, that I have to test all the systems. So we did in Battersea Park also a helicopter flight. And when you look to such a picture, I mean, what else can you tell? And if this gets democratized for a wider range of people, the even more, um, I think people will use such a service. Unfortunately, or luckily still, services look like that today. So we can only do better. Yeah? So not stand, standing in lines, queuing there. And on the road, and I don't go into detail about that, we had a good speech yesterday about growing urbanization to 68% uh, in megacities. I think that's a given. What I wanted to touch base today is a couple of questions that I sensed um, yesterday. A, is there a need for this air mobility, air taxi service? And I will, will go into detail. Are the technologies there yet from our point of view? And also, um, what about certification? I heard a lot of discussions yesterday around certification. Uh, and Right or wrong, but we work very uh, close with regulators, and I do not see it so critical. Maybe I'm too optimistic about that. And fourthly, also, I, I brought with me how such a service could look like in the future, also in an example city like London. So basically, how it will look like is you have your app on demand, you book instantly, like, like you book an Uber, the air taxi, it comes to your final destination, you hop on and fly to your final destination. Of course, in the beginning, we will have point-to-point -point routes. So from A to B, for example, from an airport to a city center. Later on, we see a network growing where you then will have on-demand spots where someone can say, well, just imagine later on where everything is connected, you have pre free uh, parking spots at a rooftop that are not used by cars, so you can hop on and hop off there, and later on this space can be used for cars. That's a bit, maybe one step further in the future, but we see that as realistic. And what is enabling that are technologies like distributed electric propulsion. And what's, what does that bring to us? It's basically safety, because now you can build into a system a multi-redundancy. Secondly, battery density, and the battery technology. And coming from the automotive industry, I heard also yesterday, will it be there? So we had the biggest cell producer in the house two weeks ago, 
And I was amazed how they deal with the topic and build up now the production. So scale will be there, that's my view, and this will drive down the prices. And also the topic distribution, um, distributed electric propulsion is not new, new. I mean, we did, and you probably know that, uh, our famous yoga ball video in 2011. That was the proof of concept where three crazy engineers said, what a drone can, we can also lift up a person. And uh, that got viral uh, by that time. Um, of course, and the thing is, it's still a world record. You see that, that it's a distributed system with propellers and you have already the batteries, that those are the white boxes below there. Of course, our product developed and does not look like a yoga ball anymore. Um, and we built into the system a full redundancy chain. So the system has 18 propellers, 18 motors, and nine battery packs giving power to the motors. So if one battery pack fail, two opposite lying motors or rotors fail, doesn't matter, we can still safely land. We also tested um, if multiple rotors or motors fail, we can still safely land. And we have built in this redundancy throughout the whole system, so multiple flight controls, battery management system, etc. Our, and again, this was a question, I mean, our starting product will be fully electric certified and can fly 22 miles. Everybody asks always, can you fly further? <laughs> I would always say, wait for it, um, because I will show also later on what you can do in 22 miles in an urban area, so our mission is urban. Secondly, we want to lift up 400 pounds, so in the beginning a pilot, a passenger, and a baggage. Fully autonomous, of course, you have then have two two places, and of course, we are also working on wider range and also on multi-seats. The most important topic I haven't heard yesterday and I want to stress is the topic noise. We designed our product with a low noise profile, and maybe now a question will ping up, how much decibel and so on. I always take away the question of decibel because it depends how far you are away, how it's measured, and so on, and so on. It's a complex question, but I can tell you this. Um, we are testing every week. I'm standing there, 50 meters, the Volocopter lift, lifts up. It has a sound like a land mowing machine. Yeah? So this is what I, how I would define it. And of course, if you're sitting in your Swabian Streber garden, so it's a garden, if some, something lands like that just one meter next to you, you don't like it, yeah, of course. Um, secondly, but saying in an urban environment where you have a truck passing by, a car, etc., when a volocopter lands next to you, let's call it 40, 50 meters, you will not even hear it because you have this urban noise environment. And this is one of the biggest topic that will allow us to fly into the city and not be ke being kept out. And of course, on the pricing level, we had that yesterday, um, we also envisage to have, in the future, premium cap prices as reference prices to our customers. In the beginning, of course, because of the um, demand and we will not have so many vehicles out there, the price will start at a higher price point. <coughs> and again, I think we talked now about the technologies that enable it and how we can do it. Now about certification. Yeah? So today, most of the air taxi providers out there fly under a permit to fly or an experimental license. So we received also that in 2016 already. And um, we can fly our object remotely controlled like a drone or um, we can fly it also um, automated with GPS waypoints. We did that in Dubai. Or we can fly it with a pilot. And we can put in the stick you've seen within a couple of minutes or maybe half an hour. So we are already prepared for the autonomous era, but we will start together with the regulators piloted. Because the visual line of sight is there. You do not have uh, the sensor uh, avoid certificate a certification of technology yet, so we think about that. And I think it's always nice that um, our founder, Alex, and uh, I think a quote 
um, from, from Dieter Zetscher from Mercedes, he said, well, you didn't make it light when you did your first flight because I think Alex weighs for two persons there, so I think we are really, <laughs> <laughs> we are really, we are really confident to our technology. So we learned now the current players are operating under permits to fly that does not allow them to already commercially sell the product and, and lift up passengers. And for that, we started the route with EASA in 2017 and worked really diligently with them on our concept. Um, we have a dedicated timeline with them um, until um, commercialization. And I think one big milestone was, was reached in October uh, last year. You probably know that. Um, a new special condition came out from EASA for VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing. Beforehand, we only had helicopter and plane, and now we have also the basis for us to build a product and to get it certified. I think that was a big breakthrough. Um, so um, yesterday I heard some discussions around, I think, or we believe, we have now the basis, we build the product and we have the specification for that. Of course, the specification needs to be detailed. Of course, things have to be added and worked out with them, but I think that's rather now execution, what I would call it. Stopping for a, for a moment now from certification coming, how can we enable a city? And I brought an example like London. How would we tackle London, for example? And I found something very funny. I don't know if you know, who, who knows the Red Flag Act? Oh, okay, <laughs> uh, two persons. So Red Flag Act, funnily, it's more coming from the car industry. It was introduced in 1865. And in said in those days, as new cars came up, that um, automobiles were required to travel at a maximum speed four miles per hour in the country or two miles per hour in the city. And it was um, um, said that a man with a red flag has to run in front of the car. Yeah? <laughs> also, that's how you can you know, uh, start a first technology. I, I didn't want to go now to air taxi, but you know, the thing is, when I looked at the miles per hour traveled and I looked at current miles per hour traveled in the city, so I, we are not so far away from the red flag act again, yeah? So when you see that in average. That was now an argument that we should introduce air taxi, by the way, so, okay. Um, next thing was, I think the last two days you arrived at an airport, like Heathrow or Gatwick, and you had several options, and just picked out now one. So you want to start from Heathrow going to revolution.aero, by cab, car takes you roughly 60 minutes, even more, depends on peak hour or non-peak hour. By train, 40 to 50 minutes, if you can hop off quickly if there are not delays. Um, and of course, with an air taxi, you would be there in 12 minutes. Well knowing, and now, of course, the question is about infrastructure. Yeah, because you can also say, yeah, 12 minutes, it's fine, but do we have a helipad here and there? And I think this is then the challenge to pick in a city the right spots where you know that nearby is a big demand and start with that route. Airport is a no-brainer. There's always constant demand. But what is the other point? And other points could be, um, as today, and also reach reachable for us, um, like flying from... Heathrow to Waterloo, or from an airport, from a business jet airport to the city center. That's all in reach with today's or our uh, technology fully electric. <coughs> Secondly, also I think about touristic routes. As you have seen my picture, I also flew around the River Thames, great. I also can see that as a quick entry to get also people, um, let's call it, yeah, helping them to understand the service and to implement the service. And thirdly, what we also see are event routes. So we are really looking to those customer profiles, business traveler, tourist, in the beginning and later on commuter. And also this way, I mean, I just picked that, there are existing helicopter routes in London. So uh, as soon as we have a certification and we can take off and land at Heathrow or at Battersea or at another place, um, we can fly that route um, because it's an existing route. We are there with a pilot. That should be possible. How do we, I mean, London is now one example, and uh, uh, let's call it uh, maybe the one in Europe for us, 
but how do we look to other places and cities? What we do from an approach, um, of course, we're not only building the vehicle, but we want to, to operate also the vehicle in the cities together with partners. And there we are looking to city partners. So meaning, first of all, what we always do, we go to the Ministry of Transport, to the Civil Air Aviation, and the city themselves. And we bring them a proposal like the route you have seen and say, we would like to do that. And then you start the first dialogue. And we are already in good discussions with a lot of governments worldwide, Dubai, Singapore being two. Then we also talk with property owners or operators that I see also here in the room. So you know the local specifics. How, what, what are the places? Where is the demand? And I mean, what I like with the Uber model, you know, their platform, they showed how demand is increasing in LA and on which spot and how many people are going from the left corner to the right. All fine, but for the first two routes, I don't need that. <laughs> I know what the most congested route is. I know what, what, where the pains are, and then I start off from that. Um, we're looking also to infrastructure in the sense of we do not want to build it, but we, we, we need our design requirements to flow into that. We are having a battery swapping concept, uh, for example. Others do fast charge, and this has to fly into those concepts. So we are working strongly there. And also with airports, I mean, um, I come to that in a second. So we also partnered with a big German airport to analyze that. And again, a question that always gets attention um, uh, when, when we speak to partners or, or investors is, is the range enough? Yeah. And I said, as I said in the beginning, of course we are going for more range later on. But in a start, when you look to the mega cities worldwide, you can cover... I would say 60 to 70% of this urban environment with a range of 20 miles. And this is our focus in the beginning. Dream is for me also, uh, it's a bit, don't quote me, bureaucratic, but Mumbai. So from airport to the city center, it's about four or five miles, and it takes you one and a half hours. So flying there five times, I mean, uh, it's a use case, uh, no doubt. Um, I want to implement immediately. Um, so again, highlighting that, we are uh, announced and we will um, fly demonstrations in Singapore in the second half of this year. We are working there again with the ministries very close together. Actually, they also approached us um, to, to, uh, to bring that technology or show that technology uh, in Asia. Another question is always infrastructure costs. And of course, you see the big hubs. Uh, that are t built and, you know, it looks like uh, skyscrapers. But you can also start step by step, right? So you, you need a simple landing site and some requirements that are regulated. And we look to helipad regulations for that, um, where you can start off and land. You may, maybe need a facility to swap manually the battery. Um, we can swap our battery today in a couple of minutes. Um, but also there are other alternatives like docks maybe on the water like at the River Thames or a rooftop that gets reinitiated. I think just to say infrastructure needs to be investigated, but you also do not have those massive investments in the beginning when you start step by step with the first round. Question always came, and that's, I'm really happy that we're partnering with Fraport, uh, Frankfurt Airport, because it was always, yeah, you want your first route from airport to city center, but airport is complex, and you know, and uh, <clears throat> can you deal with those guys? And um, actually, uh, we're working there very close with, um, with Fraport together and looking really on the passenger handling flow, A, and B, also um, on takeoff and landing sites at airports and which requirements, as we heard yesterday with energy and so on, does an airport need to be prepared for this next step? And again, it helped also because now a lot of airports are calling me. Um, third topic was yesterday, and I spoke with Steve uh, to last night. Oh, 150 concepts out there. Oh, my God. I mean, I see that rather, and you see that in the automotive industry, the whole community now has, has to drive something forward. And if there is an announcement yesterday with with Airbus, that's positive for the whole industry that something is going on and that the regulators are looking into that. So I see it rather as frenemies or friends to bring something forward. And second point is, told Steve yesterday, well, look, there are 150 concepts out there. 
but how many are actually flying in a full scale? Maybe it's one hand, two hands of, of vehicles out there. So I think the one thing is, and don't get me wrong, having a concept, and the other thing is really daily flying and operating. And maybe for the investors of you, but you maybe have analyzed that more to that, just wanted to show that. Um, there are different studies now out there that put some figures to the market, and I just found interesting that <clears throat> one and a half years ago, you know, the market sizes were estimated like 30 billion, 20, 40, and now, the last uh, months, you know, we are already at 500 billion for the full market, and even going on top of that. Is that realistic? I don't know. But it shows that there is A, investment and VC money going in, that there is interest by the big ones flowing into that, and that helps, of course, us also. To finalize that, I think we have come a long way. So we started in 2011. We already hit a lot of milestones, and I'm happy to share that with you and to work also with you on that to bring it really to life. Let's do it. Thank you. Do we have any old-fashioned questions that people would like to ask? Oh, we've got loads. Okay. Sorry, I'm... Oh. I'll give you that. I'm slow this morning. Um, I see you describing about one pasture, one pilot, or autonomous thing. So do you see this more of air taxi or more uh, personal use as far as you know, acquisition by private individuals? Um, I mean, w and what's the price point on this? The second question we can talk offline. <laughs> uh, first, <laughs> the first topic is we started out that we wanted a people mover, so actually that everybody can use it or, or, or buy it but we went away from that. And the mere fact is there that we said we want to have, especially in the beginning, control over the vehicle. Because I have a database and 500 requests that someone wants to buy that vehicle. Um, but topic is reputation. So what if a crazy enthusiast flies on the thing against something? So that could damage also the whole industry in the beginning. And secondly, I think we know best in the beginning how to operate it, change a battery, etc. So that's why we're saying we will not sell it to individual persons, but rather manage it with operators together uh, in cities and start a, really a service then to go for, for masses and not I'm going from Mykonos to the next island. Yeah. Will that come maybe and democratize in the, in the future? And we are open to that, yes. But the first routes will be operated by us with partners. Congratulations for, <coughs> for getting certification. Um, in terms of testing and flying over the cities, as you know yourself, with, uh, with helicopters, we have a uh, stranger regulation, you know, over city twin engine operation. How, what did you put in the program to ensure that uh, extreme safety is taken for crash emergencies and, and, and the built-in safety in the system? Particularly when you run on battery and you have a cell that packs up and you do the exchange and something goes wrong, you've got no redundancy on the, on the power. What was the plan? A lot of questions, so going backwards. So we see the swapping mechanism as part of the operation, just to give you one quick answer. So when you today fly a glider, you also put on the arms at the airplane when you start off, and this is part of a normal operation. So we see the battery swapping concept as the same, so part of the operation, and it must be handled safe, but we do not see a separate um, certification for that. Secondly, as I said before, we will have one of the highest standards, risk standards to achieve. So right now you can read it in the current proposal of EASA, it's 10 minus 9. Yeah. And we have to fulfill that throughout the whole chain. Because um, of critical city operations, that will be the topic. So by nature we design now our product and, and build it to that norm, yeah, from electronics, from, um, from the, the battery that we have always, a, a, let's call it a, a fallback uh, cushion. Uh, we are also looking at the, and that was your first question, 
of the concept of operation. So when we perform a flight, we will, we will define with the city and with the regulators together for emergency landing spots if something happens. So especially in the first routes, you will have something like that, that if something is, you can still safely land there um, to that. Did I tackle some of the question, or do you have any other points? That's fine. Okay. Do you know? <laughs> Thanks. Demand will be driven in large part based on the cost that you're able to achieve per passenger mile. Uber's goal for, uh, it, upon introduction, is about $5 a mile, falling to about $1.50 a mile, and then eventually getting down to, they think, about $0.44 cents a mile. What are your cost targets per so, mile? So, yes. Yeah. So, starting in the beginning, I think there are two areas. So, for us, the biggest portion is, on the cost level, is the battery. And I think it's, uh, uh, that is also known to you. Um, but we see the sell price going down, and that will help us a lot. So we see similar starting points, like Uber, yeah, for, on our cost profile. And the things that will help us is, of course, autonomy, because the pilot will go out, the pilot costs. And secondly, that we can then fill two seats, right? So that's the, the simple mathematic. Um, Next to that, I think, uh, as I said, biggest portion battery. And I don't see it yet at 44 cent, to be honest. Um, but I see it in a range, as I said, today, so that you have for a flight of 15 miles, that you then have a price of around $40, $45. That's what I see realistic. Because you also want to make profit, <laughs> let's call it at the end. and. Um, I also do not question mark underestimate additional operational and infrastructure costs you will have in the future. So we built out of that in, um, into our model. Uh, good morning, Christian. Yep. Uh, with regard to noise, um, there's a lot of focus in the industry on sort of cost per mile and uh, you know, battery costs, etc. cetera. Um, uh, over here. OK, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, so in 1957, there was an aircraft or a helicopter called the, the, fer the ferry Rotodyne, and that was uh, cancelled a few years later only because of noise. Um, so outside existing helicopter routes, um, is, this, you know, is, is your design likely to actually succeed in an, in an urban environment? I don't, um, you know, it will not be, you know, now the question is like, can we land everywhere? Yeah, no, in the beginning not, but you will pick and you have already, like in London in Harrods, or you have in, on the Swiss Tower in Singapore, already existing infrastructure that is not used. And I think to re-enable that, that will be easy. And I think we will be allowed, and then we also have to testify that we have a low noise profile to fly into the city, actually. I think this will come definitely. <laughs> Depending also, maybe you start then with a touristic route, and you fly over a river or a shore, line, that will be the first things you do, and then step by step integrate you more into the city center. But again, when speaking also with authorities, we always strive for the most extreme case, let's fly into the city center, because later on you have to negotiate back anyhow. So start with the case that is the, the, has the highest, uh, let's call it probability for demand, and then see how you can work with the cities um, on that around. That's a bit the philosophy we have. And um, also with regard to uh, rotor noise, sorry, quick question. Um, so it's been shown that with small rotors, the smaller the rotor, the larger the noise. So the larger rotor designs are actually quieter. Just to correct you on that. Yeah. So flutter over there is a bit quieter. A blatant self. Um, another no. question? No, I'm going to pass. No, no, no. Okay. Christian, you're getting too many questions, so I'm going to stop you. Thank you very much.